regretting mistakes is yeah. is a waste of time. Yeah. You know, you gotta embrace the mistakes. You know, I, I there was there was times in my life where I, I you know I felt things and and have made mistakes. You know, and and, and misjudge certain things that I did or said um, that really cost me a lot of a lot of pain and a lot of sadness. Um, but you know, I also appreciated that lesson because yeah. it made me a better man, yeah. a better friend, um, and realized that I, I had to make some quick changes if I was gonna really still be around yeah. at 37. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to the School of Greatness podcast. We've got the legendary Wilmer Valderrama in the house. Thank you so much, Thank man, you, man. For Thank being you so here. much for having me, man. Excited that you're here. Uh, mutual friend Andrew Sandler connected us, and he said, you got to have you on. He said you're one of the most inspiring guys he knows. Oh, that's nice. So I said, all right. I actually didn't know much about you. You know, I don't think I've watched much of your stuff. Obviously, 70s show, I watched a few little moments here and there, but I was not like a big fan of the mm-hmm. show. Mm-hmm. Not that I wasn't a fan, but I was no, just no, like, I get it. Yeah, yeah. man. Uh, and I was like, all right, I want to learn more. So I was like having Andrew kind of tell me more about you. But I was like, if he recommended it, and I know you're friends with Scooter and a bunch mm-hmm. of other mutual friends that we have. So I was like, I'm sure he's more than just a character on a, <laughs> on a show. So I'm excited you're here. I appreciate you being Thank here. Thank you. No, and, and vice versa. I'm excited to, yeah. you know, to be to be on your show. I really appreciate what you're what you're trying to do with, yeah. you know, with the simpleness and yeah. of of uh, of a philosophy that works mm-hmm. for for anyone who's listening. Yeah. You know, I think it's it's inspiring to to share your stories. I think that, you know, today, the only, the education we need the most is, is peer to peer, right? The education we need the most is, is having, you know, young people share their stories and having those stories create their own personal philosophy and how to navigate life in, in, in the most effortless way possible. And I think that if you're doing this on, on, on every pot, you know, podcast basis, I think that, um, you're moving the needle on yeah. and making it a better place. That's the goal, man. Connect the human race and help people live their best lives. That's right. what we're all about. So, um, now I'm curious, you, you grew up in LA for a few years, then you moved away to another country. Is that right? Yeah. So what happened is my, my, what happened was my, my mother and my father met in Miami and when, uh, they got married there and they had my sister and I in Miami we were born in Miami, and when I turned three years old, you know, back then the dollar and el bolivar, which is the the national coin in Venezuela, was actually very close. Really, you know, so because Venezuela is the number one reserve oil uh, in the world and was one of the richest uh, countries when it comes to natural resources, so they were exporting, you know, uh, you know, a very very influential amount on a right. global scale. Right. So um, the agricultural industry was booming because they were exporting, you name it, right? And my dad, you know, found passion in the agriculture industry, and he decided that it was time to move back to Venezuela uh, for business, and we went back to work, you know? And also, Mm -hmm. he's Venezuelan. My mother is Colombian, you know? So they went back to what they knew, you know? And uh, living in America was amazing at the time. Um, But, you know, they went back to the roots. And so they brought my sister and I into Venezuela, and we were raised in Venezuela, um, probably a third in Colombia, most of the time in Venezuela. Sure. And so we were raised in Venezuela until I was about uh, about 13 and, 13 and change, almost 14 years old. And um, around that time, the the country politically and economically was showing signs. You know, there was there was flags being thrown well, on the field. It's crazy right now. <laughs> I mean, and, and chaos. the point is that I saw the, uh, you know, the start of the evolution. Wow. Of the deconst- deconstruction of of a country that that was that 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 was you know um, so influential in South America, yeah. And uh, so my dad saw the first you know national coup you know, and when it didn't succeed, the first one didn't succeed, and it was led by a young military uh, guy named uh, Hugo Chavez. Mm-hmm. And my dad said, "Okay, guys, this is not looking really good. <clears throat> the corruption is taking a toll on the economy. Corruption is taking a toll on the last ten years of growth." And my parents decided it was, it, was, it was time to come back to the United States. Uh, and really the reason why we came back uh, was to, and I quote from my dad, to say, you know, me, I'll get the education that I never had. Mm-hmm. You know, and 
um, you know, to me, that was really significant. And that was something that I was told when I was 13. Hmm. Um, and so when I came to the United States, I felt like that was my job. My actual full-time job was to get the education my parents never had an opportunity to have. And you didn't speak English then, or did you? I didn't even know how to speak English. In fact, <laughs> this is the thing that sucked the most about it. Because <laughs> my, my dad is like, my dad was like, okay. Um, well, so here's what happened. So I was, you know, in, in Venezuela and in Latin America, they make you take an English class. Mm. And if you don't have an interest in English class, it's okay for you to flunk it. <laughs> right, right. You failed it, you know. And I was failing all my English classes. I was failing all my English classes. And then my dad <laughs> literally one month tells me, okay, uh, Marilyn, Stephanie, Wilmer, um, we're moving back to the United States. I go, huh? Because <laughs> I literally, at this point, I was always saying to myself, you know, I never, I'm never gonna have to need need how to speak English. Like, I'm, I live in Venezuela, I don't speak Spanish yeah, yeah, over yeah. here. Why would I ever learn how to speak English? You know, I'm never gonna go to America. We'll cut to packing our bags <laughs> and you know, and and having to having to uh, relocate to to United States and yeah. and knowing that the first thing I had to do was learn how to speak English and be the first one in my family to speak English. Wow. Yeah. And where did you guys move? Right to LA? Or you back to yeah, Miami? So we were in Miami for a couple of weeks. And fairly quickly we realized that there was really not much for us there. My dad had a brother. How many and, jobs there? I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, my dad, it, it just literally, it was not necessarily what my dad wanted for us. You know, and we we drove cross country, cross country um, got to know the, the country on a different level, you know, seeing the American flag everywhere was, mm. was so eye opening. You know, it's just, you, you knew. It was a line of the opportunity, you know, and and uh, we we went all the way to Los Angeles, and when we got to Los Angeles. Why um, LA? Well, my dad had a brother here. Okay. One of his brothers had a little uh, a rental car place, you know, uh, close to uh, LAX. Yeah. And he said, you know, come out here, stay with us, you know, for you know a couple of weeks, six weeks, or whatever, so while you while you get it together and get a job and do your thing. My dad said, okay, perfect. And uh, we landed in Los Angeles. Well, we drove into Los Angeles, and we went to stay with my uncle and his wife right. and a couple of my cousins. And, um, you know, I, I, the point was that my dad had sold everything he had in Venezuela so we can have enough capital to establish a life out here without having to really struggle with it. Right. And being at my uncle's house for a couple of weeks, you know, you know, maybe, you know, maybe like two, three months or something was going to help him really slowly, really get the right house and those different things and, and help him get enough of a job so he can have at least a month of income, you know, well, weekend that really went south. Right, <laughs> like, right. <it> was <laughs> not going to work. You know, my mom and, and, um, my, my uncle's wife just did not get along. Mm. Um, and, uh, there was something terrible and really bad that happened between them. And we were just like, okay, <laughs> okay, we probably we should move out, you wow. know? And, uh, really what happened was, and, and, you know, if I can be just super open and, sure. and, and raw about it, you know, um, my, my, my parents were helping with the groceries too, you know? So, you know, I went to open the, the refrigerator. It was so stupid. It's so silly. But I opened the refrigerator and I got a popsicle. And my uncle's wife grabbed the popsicle off my hand, put it back in, and said, that's not for you. And my mom just lost her mind. Like, lost her mind. I've never <laughs> seen my mom black out, you know? <laughs> and we're calling my, my dad and my uncle and like, hey, that that the time. We're like 13 years wow. old, 14 years old. We're like, what am I, what, what do we do? Right. And, um, you know, my parents came and he was like, you know, we have to figure out. So we, we got into a hotel, you know, and then, and then, and during that hotel stay, you know, my, my dad was, you know, obviously burning some cash to try yeah. to keep us going, you know, and then eventually we got this little tiny house in Van Nuys, you know, in Van Nuys, California and got a house. Um, it was like a two bedroom little house where the, you know, the living room and the kitchen and the. And the dining room was all in one space, you know, and we had a nice tiny little backyard. Um, and uh, my sister and I share one room and my younger sister w was sleeping in the same room with my parents. So uh, and that was the beginning. That was how we just kind of got, you know, kind of right. got established. Out here. Wow. What um, were you acting before that or into entertainment or producing or singing before this or? Well, back in Venezuela, I lived in a very small town. I'm talking like like i don't know 19,000 people wow. right and spread out in two little zip codes that were yeah, yeah. basically so small that were pretty much considered a, a city you know it was called acariwa and araure so when people talked about 
the style portuguese is you know i could eat one out it they they'd be like they'd be like where where are you from they'd be like i got eat one out it you right, know right. because it was this small little town mm-hmm. went to school there um but they have only have one movie theater all year round mm. and they have one movie theater and they only play one movie all year round one movie and For the was, whole year yeah and it was robocop Huh. And I would watch RoboCop in English? Back, to back to in English, <laughs> and they had the subtitles. Sure, sure. Um, but I would watch RoboCop, and wow. I, ever since I was started watching RoboCop, I'm like, oh, this is so cool, it's so fun, you know. And and I was a huge fan of the bad guy in it, and that's relevant because I, I come full circle to it, you know. But I, um, there was nothing to do, so performing arts is something that's big in Latin America, yeah. you know, and in Venezuela, it's also even more serious, you know. So. So I uh, I enrolled into these classes and I started doing singing, dancing, and acting, and uh, I started doing a lot of theater. And really? um, but I was doing it since I was six or so. Wow! So when I came to the United States, I felt like the one thing that was gonna improve my speaking skills and was gonna force me to read and force me to speak out loud and like you know and and kind of break out of that that shell uh, was to go back to theater. Really? So wow. I went back to theater, not even really knowing how to speak English. And uh, I think my first character was playing the Beast and Beauty and the Beast in, in junior high. <laughs> and here's why that's really funny. Uh, it's because I didn't have any lines. So <laughs> you're just like, ah. I, I basically, some, my teacher would literally recite the Beast's lines uh. off, off, off stage. And I would just mime as, as if I was speaking. Perfect. So it was the easiest job, but the funnest too. I'm like the Beast, you know, I'm the Beast and Beauty and the Beast. And... You know, and the whole time I'm like, someone is speaking for me off camera, mm-hmm. and I'm just pretend off camera, off stage, pretending that like, you know, I'm the one saying it. Right, but that right. was my first acting thing. That's funny. Because uh, I really didn't know how to speak English, but I wanted to be in theater. Right. And the teacher was kind enough to let me in there. <laughs> Not knowing I couldn't even read a script. Right, right. That's cool. So you got back into it pretty much right away. And being yeah. in LA, it was probably like different opportunities here to do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think mostly, mostly what happened was for me was. Um, you know, it was just, I, I, the more I the more I did theater, the better my English became, right. and uh, the faster I learned how to communicate. And yeah. then fairly quickly, I realized that knowing how to speak English was the only weapon I needed mm. in order to go out there and defend myself and conquer. Mm. Right? As soon as like English was part of my my you know my utility belt. Mm-hmm. I knew that absolutely anything can happen now really? because if I could learn how to speak a crazy language <laughs> like this at, thir- at 14, 15 years old, yeah. I'm going to be unstoppable, wow. you know? And, uh, and that's kind of what happened. You know I mean? Did, did a lot of theater. And then at some point the teacher said to me, you know, Hey, you know, you're pretty funny. You should, uh, you should give it a try. You know? And I said, I said, well, maybe, maybe I should give it a try. I guess I don't even know how to start, you know? So she told me doing a couple of commercials here uh-huh. and there, you know, you, you make some money and stuff, and I sold it to my dad as like, Dad, I have good grades, so if I keep continuing my good grades, can you take me to some auditions? Yeah. And my dad said, Mijo, you, uh, uh, my dad always sounded like he was drunk. He was like, <laughs> uh, um, uh, if you uh, want to do it, it's okay, it's okay, but ace. Ace. That's what he wanted. Ace. Ace. I was like, okay, that. So I was kind of a pretty, pretty good student. That's good. Um, but yeah, so that that's that's kind of how I started. And what was the first kind of big break? I guess before the '70s show, was there like some a big commercial or something else that you got through? Like, oh, I'm actually, I can do this, and yeah. I can like keep going. And so I think it was my theater experience in high school that made me feel like I can get used to this. Mm. Like I, I'm having a lot of fun. Maybe I should do more theater. Yeah. I knew this was, I wasn't thinking I was going to be in the commercials and the movies and TVs. Like my ambition was to, you know, was to just kind of continue to do theater because I was, you know, I wanted to be a pilot for the Air Force, you know. And if not, I wanted to be a psychologist. You know, I just wanted to like study minds and help people and and all that. And then, um, you know, they said to me, uh, the the teacher said to me, hey, listen, you know, I I think you should go out and audition and stuff, you know, and. I had met this this drama teacher outside of my high school uh, named Celeste Boyd. And Celeste, uh, honestly, is the reason why I confident said I confidently said, I'm going to be the best at this. Mm. 
I'm going to be the best at anything I do will be remembered. Like it, she was the one that kind of groomed me and she started, she said, Hey, I want to teach you. Um, I want to, I want to bring you to my acting class at Wednesdays. Mm. She's a pretty well known, right? I feel like I've heard that name. Before. So, so I mean, if you're in the industry, you know who she is. Yeah, I've heard her name she before. is, uh, she's someone that iconically has helped so many people yeah, that's too. What I've heard. Um, uh, and I hope that she continues. She and she's still doing it because she's she's an amazing woman. But yeah. so uh, she brought you into her class. She brought me into my into her class. And, and you're I said, how old? I, I can't or? pay for it. I was about sixteen. I was yeah. yeah, I was about sixteen years old. I said, by the way, I can't pay for it. I have no money. And she was <laughs> like, No, I want to teach you for free. Wow. And I said, Wow, that's amazing. I said, Can I bring my sister? <laughs> she's like, Okay, you can bring your sister. <laughs> my sister and I did everything together. And she, you know, in her class, it was 40-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 20-year-olds, you know, and as a 16-year-old just trying to do scenes to learn from all these awesome actors that were older than me was was, was mm -hmm. great practice. Mm -hmm. Then she introduced me to an agent. The agent said, I'm not going to I'm not gonna represent you, but I'm going to take you out and see what kind of feedback we get, right? It's kind of like representing, right? I mean... <laughs> kind of, but it's like it's a probation. Without committing. Yeah, yeah. It's like a probation <laughs> way of, of, of representing somebody. So, you know, so he, he sent me on this... Um, and this Doritos Doritos commercial, oh. um, and they call him. He says, "Look, the kid is awesome. Like he's really, really good. He's really funny, but he has a crazy accent, <laughs> and we cannot take him because Latinos on television shouldn't have an accent." Mm. And this was back in '96 or so. So, so they, but but I just know the kid is really good, and agents like, "All right, cool." So he sent me. On, on another commercial, which I got, literally the second commercial I got. Wow. Which was a Pacific Bell's Marge Lupages commercial. It was a regional commercial. Pagers? Pagers. Like pages. The, yeah, the yeah. yellow I pages. Gotcha, gotcha, yeah. the, 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 so it was the, the Pacific Bell's Marge Lupages. Uh -huh. And it was original. It was for California. Mm. And it was in Spanish. Perfect. It's perfect. perfect. And I had <laughs> the irony is that my, the only line in the commercial was. The Pacific Bells March of Pages. <laughs> and you have to speak Spanish at all in the, in, the, in the commercial. But it was very nice. It had my fake family. And I was like, well, I got a fake family. It's my fake dad, my fake mom, uh, it's my fake sister. This is crazy. <laughs> and then so I went in there and I did the commercial. It was awesome. And with that money, I paid my dues and I became a Screen Actors Guild member. Wow. I became a SAG <clears throat> member. Then. And then he's like, okay, you know, send you a couple of other things. And, and I started booking things back to back to back because I was having so much fun. Uh. Like There's I wasn't no scared, no yeah. pressure. I was no, I wasn't scared. Like this, this. Uh, I have the, to get this. That's right. Yeah. The audition, I didn't, I didn't depend on the audition. So, so, uh, I'm wow. so sure I started booking job after job, and then uh, I remember, and this is the part that's the most significant to me in my life. Um, I remember there was a time where, when I was, uh, was about, I was about to turn 18 years old, and this is about almost, almost two years into me auditioning and stuff and getting little commercials here and there, little spots and still doing theater in school um my dad was running errands for this mechanic shop so he would bring parts over and, yeah. and that's how he would get paid all these errands and you know he did that for a couple other places and you know he would get in there and, and try to you know get with the mechanic shops and stuff and i remember that one night there's a little commotion in the house 2 a.m in the morning and i see my mom and my dad scuffling in the living room and i said what's going on and i get up and I asked my dad, what happened? And my dad said to me, um, they stole our car. Mm. And, and, and if you know anything about anything in Los Angeles, if you don't have a car, I mean, it's like... You can't get anywhere. You can't get anywhere. <laughs> yeah. And my dad's complete hustle like relied on that car. Mm. And my dad is really worried. My mom is crying. And I just, at like 15 years old, I, <clears throat> you know, I looked at my dad, 15, 16 years old, so... I looked at my dad and, and I said, dad, don't worry because, you know, I'm going to be this famous actor and I'm going to be a famous actor and I'm going to produce, I'm going to direct and I'm going to have these companies, I'm going to have restaurants and I'm going to have all these businesses and we're never going to have to worry about this and I'm going to buy us a house. And my dad looked at me and he said, okay, mijo, you can do that. And it was, to me, it felt like he gave me permission to do it. Wow. When he said, you can do that, I feel like in that moment, I feel like my dad has said, go ahead, you can do that. While I figure out this car situation, you go ahead and <laughs> become what you want to become. Wow. So I went ne the next day, I went to school. And we walked to school the next day. And I got to school. 
and I, I hit the books extra harder. And every time I got on stage, I was performing louder than anybody else. And I would eat everyone's meal. And I was like, this is, this is mine. <laughs> and, and he, you know, and then this teacher um, said, man, you're, let's take you to the advanced class. You want to, and so I was helping producing the, the plays. And then at some point, I wasn't even supposed to say this, but my drama teacher will go on her own auditions and will leave me teaching drama. Wow. So it was like, I was like so into it. It's like, this is going to work, you know? And, but I also, in like in the afternoons, I would play with my Salvadorian Mexican, you know, I, I was in a soccer league. So people always wonder, you were in the country for so long, how do you still have an accent? You know? And I go, well, because I play <laughs> soccer yeah. with, you know, with Mexicans and Salvadorians and with the Matecos and, you know, every day. And I feel like that's the reason my sister has zero accent because she had a bunch of white girlfriends that would yeah. go to the mall all the time. <laughs> and she would say the word like a lot, you know? Um, but anyhow, fast forward, that happened. I told my dad that, and I remember, wow. you know, kept auditioning and stuff. And at the worst time of our lives, uh, my teacher, my teacher, my agent sends me on this audition. It's my first pilot audition. And he said, uh, here's the sites that are not going, going audition. I go in, have a meeting, audition. They called me back, called me back again. And they said, hey, we're going to bring you back to producers. And I go, oh, I'm getting a call back. That's great. But in my mind, I'm like, this is mine. Wow. I'm getting this pilot. In. This I'm getting this pilot. It's my first pilot ever. And I went to the last audition and they told me, just have a little more fun with it. It's very cool. So... So I went in, uh, audition. You know, oh, first of all, they outside they bring you a contract. You know, when you go to network auditions, mm -hmm. they bring you a contract and they go, "Hey, listen, um, you were gonna make, I think, fifteen thousand dollars for the pilot, and if it goes to series, you're gonna make ten thousand dollars per episode." And that's a lot of money back then. Are you kidding me? That's I was like seventeen year old. You're more, like <laughs> that was like more money that we made in the year. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I looked to my dad and I said, Dad. Could you imagine if I get this? Could you imagine if I get this right now? Like, even if it doesn't go to serious, it's going to really help us, you know? And and my dad said to me, without missing a beat, he said to me, Mijo, uh, um, if you get it, uh, very good. If you don't get it, uh, very good. Mm. And I said, okay, very good. And I walked in and I just auditioned stress-free because I knew if I got it, awesome. If I didn't get it, awesome too. We're back to the drawing board, you know? I go home. Um, my agent calls me and says, uh, hey, good news. Uh, they want you to come back tomorrow. And I told my dad, hey, dad. And everyone's on the phone, like, listening. I said, hey, dad, <laughs> we got a call back. We're, we're really close. And then my DJ, the, the agent says, um, and says they, they want you to come back tomorrow. And the day after that, and the day after that, and the day after that, and the oh, day after man. that, and everyone's like <laughs> crying and going crazy, and we're like, Jesus Christ, what just happened? Lord, thank you so much. Wow. And, and in that moment, I looked out, saw the American flag, and I said, this is what it's about. How much more can I do? How much more can I go? How hard can I go, you know? And I said to myself that everything I did in this pilot was going to be the most memorable. I was said to myself, this is everything that comes out of my mouth. I'm going to just... I'm going to work and I'm going to, and nobody's going to fire me from this job. Mm -hmm. All I kept saying is, I don't want to get fired. I went in, did the pilot. Maybe like a month later, I get a phone call from my agent again says, Hey, listen, congratulations. They, um, uh, he said, he said, good news and bad news. I said, what's the bad news? He goes, well, the bad news is that they changed the name of the show from Teenage Wasteland to That 70s Show. And the good news is that you're going on television. The show is going on Fox. And they ordered 13 episodes. It's huge. And I, and I said, wait, the show's about the 70s? <laughs> no idea. I was like, oh, I think this is how Americans dress, I guess, in Wisconsin. I don't know, you yeah, know? Right. I had no idea the show was about the 70s. And then comes to find out the show goes on for eight years, 200 episodes, Crazy. and can't pay the way for everything I'm doing today now. That's insane. And, and then, I, you know, I, I remember the day, like that, the week before I got this this pilot, my mom and I were walking over to the, you know, to the 99 cent stores to, to get our groceries, you know. And I remember walking over it and, you know, walking a couple of miles to get back to the house with the bags to see my mom's hands, you know, really red, taking, you know, taking the bags. And, you know, we would rest every two blocks. We put our bags down and carry and continue. And I looked at my dad and I looked at my mom and I said, Mom, don't worry because one day we're going to drive, you know, and one day we did. And that's just 
that was the example. That was just you say it and you just have to do it. It just not it's not even gonna come to you. You just if you're gonna say it, you have to follow it with your actions and you have to manifest it with with how much do you want it? And is it is it within your spirit that once you have it, can you hold it? Can you keep it? And that is only your etiquette that's going to dictate whether you're going to keep it or not. Mm. You know, so I look back on my mom and my dad. I retired both of them. And, wow. you know, the first thing I did with, when we got picked up on the show, I bought a house. Wow. And I said, we're not paying rent anymore. Because we were like three months late in rent sure, when sure. I got the pilot, you know. So so that was that was the beginning of, uh, of my career. And, and, and really the, the American dream I was about to experience in Unbelievable, America. Unbelievable, man. Yeah. Unbelievable. Crazy. I'm so curious to know about, you know, these, how many years were you in Venezuela? 12 years, you say? I was about uh, almost 11 years. 11 years in Venezuela. What do you think was the biggest thing that you learned growing up there in South America that is different from the kids that grew up in U.S. or in L.A. that kind of gave you an advantage? Yeah. Going in with this, like, mindset and this belief in yourself For that sure. you could create whatever you wanted. What do you think was that lesson you learned that was different? Reality. You live a reality in our countries that kids out here will just never feel. We'll have a tough time understanding empathy. Or empathy. Like, we can sympathize in our countries with opportunity. We can take advantage of opportunity. South America? South America. Yeah. Um, specifically Venezuela. Re a reality that unfortunately most young people today can only appreciate through an Instagram post. Mm -hmm. um, that gave me the edge. When oh. I came here and I saw, you, you got to keep in mind, our six o'clock news was decapitations and school buses getting sprayed by AKs and, you know, cartel movement and, and you know, and, and you know, bombings and, and wow. you know, you know, senators police getting murdered and, and police yeah. corruption and all that stuff. And you're talking about a crazy level of, of, of danger that affects the poorest and the richest community all at the same. And then you come to America hmm. and people are talking about, oh, another drive-by. And they're talking about like the violence in, you know, in the hoods. To me, that was like, what? This is Disneyland. We are in Disneyland. Like this, <laughs> the United States is the best, is the most, is the, is the purest place on earth. <laughs> like literally right. anything can happen in this place. You have an environment. You can literally choose the environment you want to be in. Right. You can get out of the hood and be somewhere else. That's safe. correct. That's correct. Where it didn't happen in Venezuela or where no. you were. It was you like move three blocks away, same thing as you block eight blocks away or if right, you go right. to a different state. Yeah. So I think the edge for us was, was that, is, is also appreciating the best and worst of your country. And then coming over here and appreciating the best and worst mm. of the United States. Yeah. You know, and, and I think... What do you mean we're not perfect here? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, but, but I, I think, in, and to elaborate a little bit more on what I mean by that is, is that if you can really keep your eyes open and if you can listen to your atmosphere... And if you could pay attention to what's happening in the world, you can be invincible. Mm. Especially if you live in this country. Yeah. You can absolutely achieve anything. Like, I just gave you a, a glimpse at, at, you know, the first 10 years of my life and literally the first four years of my life in this country. Mm -hmm. And in that glimpse of it, <laughs> if he doesn't tell you that, like, you have zero excuse, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what else can, you know, but I come full circle to, like, coming from Venezuela, knowing that right now, 20 years later or so, Venezuela is, you know, middle class people have to stand in line, doctors, you know, doctors, uh, uh, um, you know, professors are, are homeless right now. You know, uh, you know, they're standing in line mm. to get a, a carton of milk and, and a bag of rice and, and, and then they X their hands so they don't come back for a second one. And they're they are organized based on the last digits of your driver license and your ID. And, and you think about a country that, you know, that had, I mean, the richest resources and was exporting and was, you know, 
it, it's it's sad, you know. And you yeah. you look at that, and and then so so knowing where you come from, it's crazy important. Never forgetting where you came from is is really the edge you have on anyone that may be consider a competition. And that's something else I tell young people when I speak and I do speeches and stuff is, is, you know, competition is a state of mind. You know, if you believe in competition, um, look in sports, 100%. But an athlete that wins over everyone and, is, and, and goes out there and plays harder than anybody else is because they know the only person they're competing with is themselves. Mm -hmm. And you've heard it and you've seen it in, in billboards and you see it in, in inspirational uh, posts. But you should really study what that means because the only one that holds you back is yourself. Yeah. Um, I never compared myself to anyone when I got here. Um, hmm. I was embarrassed about my accent for a second and then I learned to find pride in it. Yeah. And then that, then at that point anything anything counted. But That's my edge good. was that, you yeah. know, knowing, knowing where you come from. We probably didn't compare yourself because there was no Instagram. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's true. constantly comparing their life to everyone else's life, right? It's true. It's true. <laughs> um, what was the biggest lesson, uh, the most inspirational lesson that your your dad and your mom taught you growing up? Um, that, has, I think the, that has supported you your entire life. Yeah, I think my dad. You know, I think my dad said two things that that really kind of made all the difference for me. And I think that the first one was, you know, in that auditioning room. Before I went into the seventh show, he says, Mio, you know, if you get it, you know, very good. If you don't get it, you're very good. Mm. It was so simple in the moment, but I've carried that, you know, through my mind, throughout my career. And honestly, what it did is it made me fearless. It made me fearless to experience uh, failure. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> so many of us put so much emphasis on winning something or achieving something, or getting a job, or getting a break, or, uh, or getting that part, or, you know, uh, the truth is that that thing, that was one of the most substantial pieces of, you know, metaphorical yeah. lessons that I got, was that if you win, great, and if you don't win, that's awesome. You walk away with something anyways, mm -hmm. and that's a success, it's a yeah. version of success, and I think that, that that's what really, that's what really um, changed my perspective, and that's why, I felt like I was booking so much back to back mm -hmm. to back and I was and when I went to that you know that audition on the seven show it made me so fearless that I went in there I had nothing to lose nothing yeah and then when I walked away gaining everything and and I think so I think that was that's something that I that I hope young people can listen and say hey wow it's don't fear failure uh <laughs> to be honest you should fear success that's the thing you should fear. Failure is, is a consequence of maybe, you know, a chance, uh, lack of preparation. Timing. Timing. Mm -hmm. um, th it, there's so many elements. Yeah. And none of those elements are personal, except for did you prepare? Did you, were you not prepared enough? Did you give it your own shot? If you can walk away saying, I gave it everything, I didn't get it, awesome. It wasn't yeah. for me. Yeah. But it's when you don't give it your 100%, that you fear the failure. That's a fact, especially in my line of work, especially yeah. if you're an actor, if you're a musician. If you go on stage and you do a showcase, if you're doing theater, if you're doing your first commercial, whatever, you get fired, you say they let you go, they give you less lines or whatever, there may be preparation, you know? But if it's not, it's also not personal. Right, yeah. I think the other thing that my dad said that made a lot of sense to me was, um, it, it wasn't what he said, it was mostly the way he lives life, hmm. you know, he laughs at a funeral. Like <laughs> right. my dad finds a way to, to really find humor in the most, the most dramatic moments, hmm. you know? And I, I learned that from him and that also made me accept faster. It made me analyze and accept and find the positive and the bad. So seeing my dad, have a great sense of humor. Like even when they stole the car, you know, my dad, it, we're really stressed. And then like an hour later, he goes, he goes, okay, we're going to have to buy new shoes, you know? <laughs> you know, so, it, it, and that, and that's like that kind of mentality yeah, is yeah. what made me feel like, oh, okay, well, you know, I, I can accept yeah. life and these punches and it's hurdles mm -hmm. and it's disasters. Yeah. And it's kind of like the book, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff because it's all small stuff. Right. It's like when you put it in perspective, it's like, okay, you know, yes, maybe something is horrible in the moment, but bigger picture, 
where can we find the humor or the joy and how right. can we move forward? That's correct. As opposed to holding on to this pain forever, you know, or this stress or anxiety. And it's a state of mind, right? So yeah. like, so I always tell people, and, and tell me what you think about this, but I always tell people, and I'm curious to see what you think about yeah. this, but I always tell people, and people in relationships and in friendships, and sometimes they have fallouts and people are break, you know, they, they hurt each other's feelings and relationships mm-hmm. and all that stuff. And and they dwell on, on the things that were that were done, you know, mm-hmm. and and they stress and they make things really complicated and I always think that things are going to be as complicated as you want them to be. And they're also going to be as simple as you make them to be. Yeah. Right? So I, I always feel like for how com- when something complicated happens, you have to remove yourself. You got to pull on the parachute and be like, <laughs> well, let me look at it from bird's eye. Because, yeah. you know, because when you're in it too much and yeah. you, you put the blinders, I feel like the problem is way bigger than you can control you it. You consumed by it. You uh-huh. can't get out of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. Yeah. Cool. Well, well, I'm glad you agree with that. Yeah, I was yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that was my... That was <laughs> no, I believe in that too. Yeah. yeah. But it, it's, it's going to be as complicated as you want it to be Absolutely. and it's going to be as simple as you want it's it to be. It's all perspective, I think. Right. I think a lot of these things come down to like... Um, being grateful for where you're at. You know, you could have been like, oh, or your dad could have been like, the car is gone. Someone stole it. We lost this money. Now we're going to have to struggle. He could look at the negatives that come from it, or he could say, oh, we get to buy new shoes and we get to lose a little a couple extra pounds. Right. I get <laughs> right. to have right. some exercise. Right, right. Now I get to see the world in a different way and I don't have to be in traffic all day long with mm-hmm. like jerks who are screaming mm-hmm. or. I'm going to be safer now because I don't have to deal with LA traffic. You know, right. you can, it's all perspective and gratitude, I think. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's any way how we look at it. Correct. Yeah. Um, and what about your mom? Biggest lesson from your mom? To get down from there. To get down from there because I, I got I got hurt every time. <laughs> get down from that tree. Get down from there. Get, get down, down from there every time. Because <laughs> she, know, she knew I was going to get hurt. That's funny. You know? And, and <laughs> this is why I think it's one of the best words of advice I've ever gotten. It's because there are certain things you know you're pushing. There are certain things you just know Mm -hmm. you're trying to get away with. And when she told me, get down from there, it was this like hunting (laughs) voice. It was like, get down from there. You're going to get hurt. Right. And I got hurt every time. Really? I got hurt every time. And, And I think it's like in the times that I climbed the tree, or the times that I push the envelope on whatever subject or category of the conversation, um, I pushed it without knowing whether I was going to win or not. Mm. Or I pushed it without actually really knowing whether I was right or wrong. So knowing that you have this voice in the in, in your head that says, get down from there, which came from my mother. Most of us have this voice that uh-huh. either tells us either yes or no, you know? My mom just kind of said at a precedent that she just knew better than me. Yeah. And FYI, your parents are always and will always be way smarter than you, no matter how smart you think you are. Mm-hmm. Period. They're years always going to have 30 years on you, and you can never get the 30 years yeah. or 40 years of experience. So your parents will always be smarter than you. Mm-hmm. And if you think your parents don't relate to you because they don't understand what you're going through. They do. You're so wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because you got to remember that we're teenagers too. Yeah, I think all I think that's a great point to make. But also, if your dad said you should be afraid of going to this audition, you shouldn't listen to him because right. he may have some predestined yeah. uh, fears of his own failures and be like, I don't want you to get hurt. So. Mm-hmm. I don't even think you should go do it right. or you're probably not going to achieve these dreams because so don't get your hopes up. That's right. So I think you need to be discerning sometimes of what your parents say. Now, if you're getting hurt every single time and you should listen. Correct. But if it's their fears trying to put on you, I don't think that's necessarily the case. But no, I, I agree. I mean, look, yeah. that, that's the that's the upside. I mean, I went, yeah. what I you know, mostly what I what I want to come across with my mom saying that is that. Is that, you know, when you have the support of your parents, you know, you should have your heart open, you yeah. know. Um, and they supported me through everything I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. They never limit me. They never That's told me good. I couldn't do it, you know. Yeah. Um, but there is families, man. There are fam- And I tell you, it happened in my family. I had family members. I had uncles mm-hmm. who were telling my dad, what is your kid doing? 
He's wasting his life. My kid is honors in mathematics. Right, right, right. My mom was like, well, what is he going to do with that? Yeah, exactly. You know, and and um, I had certain aunts from my mom's side that would be like, my kid just graduated with honors in something, something, something. And my mom would be like, oh, well, he just did another play. And um, yeah, <laughs> he was very funny. And <laughs> so, but, you know, but my parents, uh, you know, were, were pretty cool with that. But, my, but you have to be aware that even sometimes your family mm -hmm. um will be the problem yeah you know but you have to believe mm. in yourself you know in order for you to identify that yeah. moment too yeah now the 70s show was like the big hit for you uh starting out and how many years was that for we did eight years and we eight did years, uh, 200 man. episodes unbelievable yeah. eight years you're you know you're making more money than you ever thought you're probably gonna make you have this massive platform. You have this huge audience that's watching you. How? What were the big lessons you learned over those eight years? How did you stay grounded mm -hmm. when all the attention of you being amazing and everyone watching and the biggest show and all this celebrity and dating all the, the right. big girls or whatever in the world? Uh, not big girls. But no, I, mean, I, the, I the, love the, big girls. The popular girls. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. on the record. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Um, but how did you stay, what are the biggest lessons over those eight years and how did you stay grounded? Um, you know, I, I was very lucky um, because the cast of that 70s show, um, Ashton Kutcher, Topher Grace, Danny Masterson, mm -hmm. Laura Prepon, Mila Kunis, Kurtwood Smith, um, you know, Deborah Joe Rubb, and the creators of the show, Bonnie and Terry Turner and Mark Brazil and, and the producers, Tom Warner and Marcy Carsey, and Peter Roth, the president of Fox at the time. They were... I mean, they were great role models, mm. and they they gave us really early advice that really kind of helped us stay grounded, you know. And but there was a moment, there was a window of my life where I thought I thought I had to do certain things because those certain things were what defined an actor in success. Like what? Um, like going out a little too much, party, you know, like no, you know. It, yeah going to the place where you're gonna get photographed for no reason you know uh, right. you know things like that and like and then only for like one year I hung out with people that I really like I had no interest and had no um relativity with mm -hmm. like we couldn't relate we didn't see things the same way but when the loud when the music is loud you kind of drown all that out and then you just kind of think that that's a real friendship yeah I had to do a real inventory in my life to to understand that um I had bigger purpose and that I um that my ambition was bigger than than just being out at a club all the time. Yeah. I enjoy celebrating my successes. So if you ever see me out, it's because something awesome just happened yeah. and something I closed a monster deal or something like that and You're celebrating. And I'm celebrating. But the days of me just randomly going out for run that's just that hasn't happened. It's eight eight years, eight mm -hmm. years or twenty yeah, eight years, nine years or so. Um, I think that 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 was that's something that really helped me get yeah. center yeah. and get some of that youth back, you know. And I think when you're young, you you should allow yourself to go out there and experiment and do what you got to do. But but based on the road and what I wanted to achieve, um, I needed to make certain changes. Mm -hmm. So, but the cast of the 70s show, we held each other down, right? We we never had to hang out with anyone else because we thought they were cool. In a, in, a most, in the most humble terms, I can say we were the coolest. Right, right. And we're we fun just, to hang out with, yeah. yeah we're we're going to hang out with this cool in this crowd, you know? And, <laughs> and, the, and the, the reason why I say that is because we were real people that just so happy to get an extraordinary job. Mm. And think about the generation before Dawson's Creek and the 70s show. Yeah. And the generation after. Oh, man. That moment in time. The reality shows, the... Yeah, before that hit, and, and right as soon as the Seinfeld was leaving the air, mm. there were some new kids in town. And I remember it was the cast of Dawson's Creek, yeah. and it was the cast of that 70s show. Mm. Meryl's Place and uh, Anna Tuerno were, yep. yeah, were having their leaving. last seasons. Yep. And it was back in 1998, between 1998 and 2006. Wow. We were real people that had extraordinary jobs. And I'm talking, you know, Justin Timberlake, uh, Jessica Biel, uh, Jessica Alba, you know, Ashton, the whole cast I just mentioned. Um, by the way, um, Jamie Foxx, Mark Wahlberg, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, Tobey Maguire, real people 
that you talk to and 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 you feel mm. connected to. It was it was a very very unique uh, country club. Yeah, and uh, yeah. we'll never have that moment again, you know. Yeah. But but I, I I gotta tell you that really also helped because uh, those people had no problem telling you, hey man, you don't gotta do that. You know, you, you should hang out over here instead. Right. You know, don't do that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like, um, like your mom. Get down. Yeah. Okay, okay, man, man, get down, get down from, from there. Get down from there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah. So I think that helped. Mm. I, that, I think that truly helped. Cool. You know, the dynamic that we had back then it really, really helped. And I, and and you look at now. I'm I'm 37 years old, mm. and from eight from 17 years old to 37, the fact that all of us are still here swinging as hard as we did and 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 doing absolutely anything we want to do mm. when we want to do it and the world and and the studios in the hollywood and the fans are still welcome us is wow. it's like i don't even know what it's it's the biggest blessing we could ever count amazing who inspired you the most from that show maybe um, maybe from a moment or from the entire experience or something they did or said you know uh from the castle show yeah you know, we inspire one another, you know, we kind of held each other up, you know, and I think it, it was, it was how real we were, you know, I do have to say that Danny Masterson really said it, it, it really great, you know, he'd been, he'd been in the game longer than us at the time, he'd done Roseanne and Sybil yeah, and all yeah. that, and he was already in that company for a while, and, you know, he kind of showed us a couple of places that we could hang out and stay out of trouble, and we would go to, you know, this, this, um, you know, every, you know, Friday night after the show, we would go to this bar called Apple Bell on Franklin and we mm. just kind of just sit outside, chill, fresh air, chill, talk and laugh. And, mm. and that was fun. So, so Danny kind of set it a good tone for all of us uh, as in like he, he never had to, he was never in the scene. You know, we kind of created our own, mm. you know, bubble. And, um, and he started that, you know, and then after that, I think, you know, Ashton, Danny and I became best friends and mm. and we never let it one do something that you know would be jeopardizing to anyone i yeah. think that that's one thing i i think ashton danny and i did for each for one another and and they really helped me understand uh is that i didn't have to do anything um based on any other perception or assumption mm -hmm. that i could just be yeah you know? yeah do you have any regrets from anything in that show that no, time? no i don't i don't regret I, I tell you i don't regret anything i appreciate every mistake um, regretting mistakes is yeah is a waste of time. <laughs> yeah, you know you gotta embrace the mistakes. You know, I, I there was there was times in my life where I, where I you know I felt things and and have made mistakes. You know, and and, and misjudge certain things that I did or said um, that really cost me a lot of a lot of pain and a lot mm. of sadness. Um, but you know, I also appreciated that lesson. Because yeah. it made me a better man, yeah. a better friend, um, and realized that I, I had to make some quick changes if mm. I was going to really still be around yeah. at 37. <laughs> now, you had this massive hit for eight years that was all over the place. What did you do after that to, I mean, it was it a challenge afterwards to, I guess, reinvent yourself and not just be known as this one character? Mm -hmm. I've had a, a few actors on who were on massive shows, big yeah. stars. And then they said for two years afterwards, they were like, I can't even get in a room because right. I'm so typecasted as right. this character and people won't even let me come read. Right. And they're just like, the money's going down. They're attached to this old show. Yeah. They don't know how to move forward. Did you have that challenge? Did you, how did you reinvent yourself and what advice yeah. would you give to others? Well, I learned, I learned really strong lessons from the sitcoms of the eighties mm. and, and the early nineties. Um, you know, I mentioned the cast of Dawson's Creek and the cast of Seventy Show. I feel like, again, we were in this moment in time where, for the first time, the studios, the film studios, were looking at this group of kids as real estate. Mm. Like, what if? What if we get, you know, James Vandervick to be in Varsity Blues? What if we get Ashton to be in, you know, uh, whatever movies he did, right? right. And, and what if you got Wilmer and Summer Catch and, you know, and 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 a company miners and all the early things that I did. Same thing with the rest, you know, Katie Holmes and, uh -huh. and, jo and Joshua Jackson, you know, like at that time that we were given an opportunity to kind of prove ourselves uh, for more than a TV actor. Yeah. Because at the time the perception was that if you were a TV actor, Stuck. you did TV. Yeah. If you did uh, movies, you did movies. If you were in the category of supporting characters like 
a fez on that 70s show, you were destined to never work again. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Somehow, you literally, you were supposed to get stuck. Yep. You're supposed to just forever. be like forever. You're the like, karate kid. You you're the karate kid forever, right? Like you're, you're literally going to be that, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, but I think that my, my and I, I think, <clears throat> I think Shani Rosen is why I go over at UTA and my whole team, my management team at the time too. Um, <clears throat> Shani and Nancy Gates and Tracy Jacobs at the time, and they, they saw me for so much more. And they saw me for so much more than, I, like I really believed in myself. But they had to teach me to believe that that I could be hmm. everything else I wanted to be, right? Producer, yeah, director, yes, whatever, you entrepreneur, can, yes, whatever. you can do, you singer, can do anything, dancer, that, anything, everything, yeah. everything. <clears throat> if I had the talent, then they we should be using it. Mm -hmm. That that was the philosophy. Yeah, and but but um, I you know I also have to thank a few people for that transition because. It was a slow burn. We were still on the 70s show when I was going out and doing, um, you know, I did Summer Catch with Freddie Prince Jr. and Matthew Lillard. And then I went and did Party Monster with uh, Randy um, Randy and Fenton over at uh, World of Wonder. And that was my first, you know, crazy, dark, under, underground movie that right. was a Sundance darling who's opened, you know, Pride Festival. And and it was the, the life of Michael Alley in New York City. And <clears throat> and I got to perform with, you know, Seth Green and Macaulay Culkin's Return film and, hmm. and Marilyn Manson and Dylan McDermott and Chloe Sevigny. And you had, I mean, to be given an opportunity to do a movie that was so raw and so, yeah. and it became such a cold, that was really important to me. So I started doing things that we show the industry, not so much like the masses, right? Like, unfortunately, mm -hmm. the masses only see me maybe in Summer right, Catch right, right. and maybe 70 Show and maybe on a company in Miners, perhaps, because that was a big studio movie, too. But in the industry, everyone's seeing it. Right. So yeah. the industry was seeing Party Monster. They were seeing, um, oh, and Fast Food Nation. Mm -hmm. Fast Food Nation was one of the biggest moments in my career. Um, even Is this though, the, the documentary? What am I thinking? No, the, the film by Richard Linklater. I'm thinking, thinking Super Size Me. Yeah, you're <laughs> thinking Super Size Me, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so... So back in 2004, I was 24 years old. Um, I have a meeting with Richard Linklater. And Richard Linklater is doing a movie by the, by the book, mm -hmm. you know, from Eric Slosser, mm -hmm. uh, Fast Food Nation. And it's going to be like the traffic of activism. Right. And he's putting together a ridiculous cast. And I, I was privileged to meet with him and tell him, hey, I'm an immigrant. I can relate to a story. Mm -hmm. I relate to what it is. Coming to America, taking jobs and doing whatever. That movie took me to Cannes Film Festival, stand next to Ethan Hawke and mm. Greg Kinnaird and Patricia Arquette and you know Bruce Willis and you know and and be 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 looked at as an actor. My entire role was in Spanish. I played it an undocumented worker that crosses the border with his family and takes a job at a slaughterhouse. Wow! And then Richard Linklater and Eric Slosser said, "Hey, some young people are listening, and people are giving att some attention right now." You have an opportunity to say things that matter, and I said, like, "Me? I think, well, actors are not supposed to get involved in politics." He goes, "Yeah, but politics are human issues, and mm. that's what changed everything for me." Mm. So in 2005, you know, I go in front of Congress and talk about uh, you know immigrant workers and, oh. and all that because Richard Linklater and Eric Slosser were the ones who who mentored me to do that, wow. and that's when I started. That's when I became an activist back in 2005. Wow. That's when I said, you know what, I, I have a responsibility with every character, I have a responsibility with everything I say. You know, that's when things drastically change and slow down for me. Um, slow and, down in terms of the acting world or in terms of... No, I slow down in, like, life. Oh, you I was the going party around, all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, 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 not even the party. Like, I was just trying to do everything, everything you know. And I was like, whoa, 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 let's be more strategic about this, you know. And But but it was thanks to my agency at the time and all mm -hmm. that, that they were that we were all, we had a great partnership. Yeah. Shani is my queen. She's everything. Shani Ross mm -hmm. is, is the best. And she she was the one that was like, take your time, take a deep breath, you know. And um, and, and that, that moment in time was defining for my transition, you know. And every character I did during the time of the 70s show in the movies mm -hmm was telling the industry, oh, wait a minute, he's not Fez. He's not Fez. He's not Fez. Whoa, I didn't think you could do an entire character in Spanish. Well, he's playing a gangster in the Spike Lee thing. Or we're like, right, right, right. You know, so all these things are happening where the industry took notice that at any minute now, I could have a character in any of these things, mm -hmm. you know? And so they, it really opened the doors. And, um, you know, I remember another pivotal point for me 
when I was I was doing I remember I was doing a seven show I was doing Handy Manny I was doing Your Mama and I was just finished and and Fast Food Nation I just premiered in Cannes and you know, Entertainment Weekly had honored me with six pages the arrival of wow. Walmart and it was like this thing and I had this anxiety how much wait we got to do some what is the next thing what's the next thing we got to do the next thing what's the next thing and I and my agents kind of slow me down he goes that's a lot. <laughs> Six things or whatever, yeah. Yeah, you you only have seven days, and I was doing you know seven days. So during the weekdays, I would rehearse seven days show. In the afternoons, I would do Handy Manny, Shoot. and on the weekends, I would shoot uh, Your Mama on MTV. And then on my weeks off, I would shoot Fast Food Nation. Wow. And or or in or another movie. So literally, I was addicted to how much more can I do? You know, and and. Um, and it was consuming me, mm. and it and I was sick every three weeks, and I was, you know, I had bags under my eyes, mm. and I still found time to actually go out and meet my friends <laughs> yeah. and, and and drink a little, you know. Yeah, yeah. And there was an, there was just not, it, I was just wasn't really balanced in the approach, mm. you know. Yeah. So Tracy Jacobs and Cheney Russell Swag said, "Hey, I, we need you to meet somebody." I go, "Ooh, okay. Where, where are we going?" They took they take me over to Disney Studios, <laughs> and we walk in to this big sound stage. And um, I just remind, reminded this actor, I'm going to mention of this story, but um, walk into the soundstage and there's this huge ship, huge ship. And I go, whoa, where are we? We walk out, there's pirates everywhere. I go, this is, this is, <laughs> wait, this is, wait, wait a minute, where are we? So Tracy represents Johnny Depp uh -huh. and she wanted me to meet with Johnny. Never been in my life. Pirates everywhere. I am, I am a fanatic of Johnny Depp. <laughs> really? Because I I relate to him and and how fearless we are when it comes to creating characters, mm. right? Like I'll create something that's so far removed from who I am, and people are like, "Who is this guy?" Right? And he's perfected that and the, he's the pioneer of that. Yeah, yeah. So, so we went to his trailer. And we sit down, and you know he's playing a little music. Is he a and full he's, character. Or he's no? in full Jack <laughs> Black Jack Sparrow. Okay? Does he speak like a normal human or like yeah. Jack Sparrow? No, he's he, no no he's speaking like a human, like, you know. But you know, dressed like the, he still has the link. Oh, like, yeah. uh, so Wilmer, come on, and welcome. How uh, yeah. was how was it, my friend? And I, so so we're we're talking, and and she just wanted us to kind of meet. She goes, I think you guys should, you know, you could talk. You have some things in common, and yeah. yeah. He shares some of his struggles in his early career, how like people sort of only wanted to see him as certain things, but he wanted to be scissor hands, you know. And and I started talking to him about, you know, uh, other things like, you know, well, here's what I'm doing. I'm doing this and the animated and the your mom on TV and this and whatever, blah. But I feel like we, what's the next thing? Like I gotta get the next thing, mm. and 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 I just get this anxiety. That I feel like you know I'm I'm I feel like I'm having a moment right now, and like there's it's we're, we're gathering heat. I feel like we gotta keep fueling the fire and keep the the steam going, you know, and the and, the, and so the train keeps going fast, you know. And I'm talking like this, <laughs> and he's smiling, and he looks at Tracy, and then he smiles back, and he goes, uh, "Wilmer, Wilmer, let me, uh, let me, let me ask you a simple question." I go, "What? Okay." <sighs> he goes, "What's the hurry?" Wait. What? What's the hurry? Why are you in such a hurry? And it changed everything in me. Because I knew exactly what he was telling me. Because life is a marathon. If you make it a s spring, you may not make it. Hmm. And then I realized I just, just need to take my time. And because of that advice, I'm a 37 years old still swinging you're not dead i'm not dead <laughs> and then he asked me what kind of actor do you want to be whoa nobody's asked me that before mm. do you want to do everything or do you want to do every character you want to do if you mm. want to do every character you want to do then you want to say no to everything you don't want to do because if you're in this hurry you're going to do things you don't want to do and it just like that's powerful it was the recipe it was a recipe for the like-minded who can mm. believe in themselves and who can take a deep breath and say, it's going to happen when it happens. And when it happens, I'm going to love that moment. Yeah. And that's, that's how it happened. And, and, that's, and that's one of the things that really, really changed my life. It was, what was the hurry? Mm. If you make it a spring, you're not going to make a marathon. 
you know, and and what kind of actor do I want to be? How would how do I want to be remembered? Really, I asked myself. And uh, you know, Fast Food Nation was exactly what I wanted to be remembered for. Mm. What he stand for, what he said, you know, who he defended, who I played, the person, the real human being I played in Fast Food Nation is who I wanted to to pay respects and honored in every mm. character I did after that. Mm. And if it was entertaining, it was like I play a villain, then I was like, it has to be an, the most awesome villain that you want to be, <laughs> you know? And and uh, and then after that, I was able to take a big break, and I just I took about a six-year break from television. Really? Wow. I took a six-year break from television and started producing, started directing, started developing, mm. started my production company, and focused on making Handy Manny one of the most, you know, the biggest show. And... Because he was helping people mm. and because families were so proud of having this little bilingual character teach they're either Caucasian or African American or Asian or or you know, or everybody else that will watch the show of any ethnicity to be proud of appreciating a second language, mm. appreciating your culture, never forgetting your roots. And I was like, That's what I wanna do. And then in those six years I became an activist. Mm -hmm. And Rosario Dawson and I, you know, were part of the whole wave of Voto Latino, started with the census, then went registering people to vote. Mm -hmm. Then after that, it morphed into more activism and starting, you know, programs like Ready to Lead for the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, which is a college readiness program for, for minorities so they understand what's out there and how they can actually mm -hmm. make college obtainable. And then, you know, after school programs, and I just kind of got addicted to touching people and, and, mm -hmm. and having them you know, see a light that I saw at one point. And then, and then eventually from then on, you know, I, I started, I somehow I started working with President Obama in immigration reform. And working with him was one of the proudest, proudest moments of my life, you yeah. know. And then from then on, you know, we went on to create other things. And, and yeah. uh, today, we, you know, America Ferreira and I created uh, Hardness, um, Hardness That Space. You know, you can go check it out. And, and it's really an organization that kind of, puts together all the community leaders and the movements uh, of the human rights and having them not only commute with one another, but share each other's strengths and weaknesses and then have a second category of, of people that have certain resources, whether it's filmmaking or funding or, or, or you know, certain ideas or tech or, or marketing to leverage that and have them all be in the same room and help mm -hmm. one another move the needle when it comes to defending what the country should be about. Yeah. And and um, harness is something that's one of my proudest you know things that I co-founded as well. But but in those six years, I became fearless to defend yeah. my family, my Latino family, yeah. my parents who are immigrants, and said that I came from an immigrant family who came fearlessly to America and mm. built things. And then you know from then on, I in those same years I went and traveled. I went to Iraq, Afghanistan, Germany, uh, you know, uh, Greenland, you know, South mm -hmm. Korea, visiting the troops, and you know, and 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 really getting to know the men and women who fight for our freedom and mm -hmm. and for the flag that we we celebrate and the American dream that we mm -hmm. all live. And um, in that moment, since that moment, when I met you know Johnny, and then getting those words of advice from my from my agents and and remembering what my dad's told me, my my parents told me, mm. in that window I perfected the man I wanted to be. Wow. And became exactly who I am right now, and who won't change but only learns. And. And who are you now? Well, today uh, I look myself in the mirror and I say, "You are Wilmer Valderrama," and you know what does that mean to you, Wilmer? That means someone that. Um, is fearless, um, you know, someone that that believes that anything is possible and the only thing impossible is what you told yourself was going to be. Um, hmm. And and honestly, uh, just a, a proud, you know, a proud son, you know, a, a, a proud, a proud of his parents and, and proud of the sacrifice. Um, but, you know, humbly so, I just think, you know, I've become exactly the person that I would look up to mm. if I was Wilmer. Mm. That's cool. And, and, and again, I only say it in the most humble terms. I don't even mean so much right. to me. It doesn't mean anything to anybody else, but I've become exactly the person that Wilmer Valderrama would look up to. Mm. And that's the only person I want to be. That's cool. You know? So, so when I, when I think back at all those years and all those mistakes and all those, you know, lessons, mm -hmm. um, it's hard to regret anything, you know? Yeah. It's um, great, man. Because it's, it's, 
it's uh it's giving me the spirit that that, yeah. that makes me live life today yeah. for sure it's amazing man and in the last 20 years you've created so much what's the vision that you have or the dream you have moving forward you know it's simple now i mean it's simple is to continue to do things i like it really is simple you know if you asked me this 10 years ago i would be i would say an empire yeah you know i'm gonna build an empire and now to me the empire i have is only as influential as the people i surround myself with and the reach and the change and the and the impact that it has on people and on society um and unity has become really the spirit of that empire mm. um mm. it's not about how much can i achieve is how much can we do and mm. it's never i mean i learned very quickly that i dream very slow very small but we dream very big yeah you know i also you know learned that the vision for what's next it's about creating a seed divorcing it emptying your pockets in the table everybody around the table empty their pockets mm. and then build a lego house from there mm. that's it that is to me the recipe for success today and for the future is understanding you have weaknesses and those weaknesses are going to be somebody else's strength so you have to never assume that that weakness you're going to make a strength because if you only focus on your strength and you allow somebody else to share their strength with you, you both just win. Mm, that is strong. And and mm. and I was a one person band for like almost ten years of my life. Tried to do it all yourself. Tried to do it all myself. And and I I, I got some things done, but not at the impact that I thought it would be. Because mm -hmm. it wasn't about the credit and it wasn't about the ego. It was about the like, no, I can do this, right? But a real leader empowers, right? A real leader inspires. And that empowerment and inspiration turns things into reality. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not it's not you did it and you came in and assembled this table. It's not that somebody had to cut this wood. Mm -hmm. You don't cut wood. You're not a carpenter. No. You, you don't make legs of steel either. <laughs> no. Right? But in order to build this table, I got to get us all together. Mm -hmm. You're the carpenter. You build the steel. But I got the screws and I know exactly how we're going <laughs> to angle it. Right, right. And now we all can su successfully, you know, mm. share this table together. Yeah. And everybody wins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so 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 I think that that's that's my vision mm. is to continue to to share uh, the success that I build with the people that I respect and love so much that mm. I happen to be sharing my everyday with right now, and having a heart open to welcome everybody else that's to say, cool. hey, man, what else can we build together? You know. Mm. That's powerful. You know when the interview goes well when I don't ask any of the questions that oh. I have here for you. <laughs> so and it just flows. I we just give my, the flow. My bring into it. No, I, I, I like could have trimmed that a little bit more. I loved it, man. I loved it. I've got three final questions. I've got a lot sure. of questions for you, but I want to kind of bring it together with three final ones. Um, the first one is called the three truths. Three truths. So if this was uh, the last day for you, and every fine last day you're you're dead tomorrow mm -hmm. right uh but you uh, or it's many years from now and it's your last day and you've created everything you've wanted to create you've done it all every dream you've achieved every person you wanted to meet and you made it happen you had multiple hang sessions with johnny depp and your life is complete you learned all the lessons you needed to learn but for whatever reason, all the, the creations that you had out in the world, no one has access to anymore. So they can't watch any shows or movies or anything that you've ever created. They don't have access to. But you have a piece of paper and a pen, and you get to write down the three truths, three things, lessons, truths that you would share with the world. And that's all they would have to remember you by, it's these three lessons. Mm -hmm. What would be your three truths? Um. I mean, very simple for me. I, I I've I live by them, and I just hope I can pass this on to my children as well. Um, <clears throat> the, the number one is what my dad said to me. You know, I think it's you know if if you if you win, great. If you didn't, awesome. Right. Mm -hmm. Number two, um, I think that you know, um, never live life. Um, with the anxiety that you're not going to achieve, right? So mm. what's the what's the hurry, right? Take your time in building a foundation that's not going to be broken, right? Yeah, yeah. Take your time. I think that's number two. Take your time. 
and enjoy the time, right? Mm -hmm. Take your time and enjoy that time. It's a moment what we have, right? The last one is something that Robin Williams, I had the privilege of asking him for advice. Robin mm -hmm. Williams said to me, he came to the Seto 70 show visiting Kurtwood Smith because they've done Dead Boy Society. And I said, you know, at like 19 years old, I said, hey, uh, Mr. Williams. He goes, call me Robin. And he was already on, you know. I said, okay, Robin, uh, a word of advice for a young buck like me, man. I, if I look <laughs> up to all your comedy and all that stuff. And he said to me, he said to me, um, okay, word of advice. He gave me two. Um, but I'm going to give you the one that I want on that list, right? Mm -hmm. So he said, uh, always remember and never forget that it's supposed to be fun. And that set it a tone for the guideline. Mm. If it wasn't fun, I was doing something wrong. Yeah. If it wasn't fun, um, I wasn't prepared enough. If it wasn't fun, um, probably at the wrong place. I shouldn't be here. Yeah. But everything is supposed to be fun. I apply it to my acting. If I'm not enjoying this character, I'm not doing something right, or this is not right. This, I'm not at the right place to where I'm supposed to be. So I would say those are the three things. You know, the last one to me is is one of the most important ones because we we yeah. forget to have fun when we work for our goals. You yeah. know, we sometimes feel like we have to sacrifice and we have to put ourselves through pain and that we have to be sore in the morning. Mm -hmm. But you you have to understand that you you have time. Mm -hmm. um, then no matter the outcome, you're going to win anyways, Man. as long as you make it fun. Yeah. What was the second thing he said? The second thing was about fans. He said to me, um, he said, so when you meet your fans, because you're going to have fans, mm -hmm. they're going to have two or three minutes of your time for the rest of their life. What two or three minutes do you want them to walk away with? Mm. I never have a bad day in front of my fans. My fans come up, they want to say hi, take a deep breath. If I'm going through something, <laughs> you smile. I'm stressed, I want to give them the same energy they give me. Mm. When they give me, they have this, they, when their eyes, when they meet me for the first time, sometimes there's tears, sometimes there's laughter, sometimes they go into this place where they remember all these characters mm -hmm. or, the, or, or they listen to all the quotes that I put on Instagram or, or, or Twitter and all that and, and, they, and they quote me back and they say that I've, I've hel you've helped me so much, you know, the things that you said really helped me while I was getting through this hard time or, or even as far as saying, like, you, know, you know, today I didn't think about harming myself. Because yeah. you made me smile today. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> all these things have to be met with the same compassion and the same love they give me. And, you know, for all my fellow actors and musicians that are listening to this, mm. it's, it's a lot easier to give a smile in the moment. It's a lot easier to take three minutes than hide and elaborately not connect with your people. Um, so to me, that, that's, that's, you know, that was very, very important to me, you know. Yeah. Two or three minutes. Yes, of course. Picture, no problem. What do you want me to sign? Of course. What do you want to tell me? This and this and this. Great. Keep 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 digging. Yeah. Keep climbing. Thanks for saying hi. And yeah. See you later. I again. appreciate you saying hi. That's the only yeah. that's the only way I, that's the way I finish every encounter. Thank you for saying hi. I appreciate you coming up. Yeah. That's cool. Um I know not everyone's like that, but <laughs> yeah. But I will say that, that that is that's my philosophy. Mm, that's cool, man. Um well I want to acknowledge you for a moment, Wilmer, for opening your heart and for listening to the mentors that were there before you who gave you great advice, but also making a massive impact on so many people, not only for your work as an actor, but really what it looks like now is mostly your activists, uh, your, your work and trying to make an impact back in the world with other things that aren't related to acting. And I think mm -hmm. that's what's going to be most remembered about you is how yeah. you made an impact for people that didn't have the voice and you using your voice for something more than just fame or recognition or money, but using it to really make a difference in people. So I want to acknowledge you for oh, well, thank you, man. constantly that. reinventing yourself, staying grounded, because I didn't know you were this grounded of a human, and having such an open heart for all of us to, to witness it. So oh, well, thank you. you. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm blessed that I was able to yeah, man. You know, share my thoughts with you and yeah. pay tribute to the people that really, really helped me. Yeah. To be honest, it was about my parents, really. Yeah. But Seemed thank like you. People. Thank you for having me, man. Of course. Um, before I ask the final question, mm. where can we connect with you online? What do you want us to take action on? Website, social media? Yeah, sure. What do you spend time on? <clears throat> sure. To, um, so, you know, the, uh, 
you know the predictable ones you know i'm obviously i'm on, on twitter i'm at at w valderrama on instagram i'm Wilma valderrama and on facebook the same thing Wilma valderrama um and um uh, there's a couple of places um that you want to know more about different mm -hmm. things and activism i think that you know voto latino is a good one if you like voting registration and what is it uh voto latino dot org voto latino yeah and uh the other one uh, which is america for us and ron pierce williams uh uh in my organization is called hardness uh hardness is quickly growing into something that we're we're going to be very proud of uh as, as a community i think uh and i think you can go to hardness that space uh, for this and just to get more information on that that'd be cool yeah. uh, other than that you know I think you know I think uh, I welcome you to kind of follow me on social media and stuff um, where, do you hang times. Out, where do you hang out the most where do you like the most right now um, I'm actually hovering a lot on Instagram yeah okay. I get lost in Instagram a lot yeah. on, on Twitter I tend to you know, promote a little bit more and then also do some inspirational quotes and stuff yeah. if you want yeah. inspirational stuff I, I post it there I hope it's inspiration. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, and um, but I think Instagram and, and Facebook are going to be yeah. uh, my most elaborate. You know, I blog a lot. I, I go live a lot and do a lot of story stuff. Dude. Cool, man. Just cool. Cool, man. Final questions. What's your definition of greatness? What's my definition <clears throat> of greatness? Oof, that's a loaded question. But my definition of greatness. But I think greatness is. The ability to only live within your strength and making that your lifestyle. If you can live within your strength and not lie to yourself that you can do other things you can't, that's one thing I feel like it's, it's greatness. Yeah. You can make something truly great if you just execute within your, your strength. And I think that's the definition of greatness. Stay within your strength. Because it's just if you're if you're within your strength, it's always gonna be fun, you know, um, and you that strength will perfect your practice, mm. and when you perfect your practice, you achieve greatness. Wilmer, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Thank this you, fun, man. Appreciate having me, man. That's great.